Dr. Castleberry here with our final few questions. We're wrapping up week three of communication cultural change. Destiny's gonna leave us leave us with some food for thought. In your opinion, looking at television American culture, do you think it is healthier for a child to talk back to a regular person like they would talk to the TV when watching Blue's Clues? Or do you think it matters? H 386. Well, not an expert, but I definitely would hold the position that talking back is a bad habit for ch for children, uh, for children of all ages. But at the same time, so is ignoring children's thoughts uh, and parking them in front of the screen. So parking kids in front of the screen is an equally bad habit as children talking back, right? So we both need to try harder. How delayed do you think television production for educational kids would be if Sesame Street had never been produced? What if in a world where television or Sesame Street, if Oscar had never come out of his trash can? Sesame Street has had a strong and, and long, uh, a sustained cultural influence. So I don't know. We can speculate. But uh, it's hard to say. Would th things would be different. I, I don't know what that would look like. They would take, sh take some of their shape or form. Perhaps if they were merely puppets instead of Muppets. I don't know. It's a, it's a question someone else could ask. Uh, re could retort. Let's see. Complex TV. Let's look at the complex TV questions here. In your opinion, do you think... Breaking Bad has succeeded because of its different mode of realism. So, page 221, uh, Mattel is talking about it performing a different mode of realism. And I talked about this already quite a bit, uh, this idea of um, it. there's a realism to it because it's so tragic, because these, we can relate to a lot of the social and class warfare that's going on in the narrative. It's happening between Walt and society, right? It's happening between the FBI and the underworld. It's happening between these 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 pieces, these members of a fractured family. Okay, and so there's a lot of a lot of painstaking tragedy, and that's what gives it an emotional realism because these devastating actions have devastating uh, impacts on on the characters on their situations um, but then it's kind of hyper real in that you know the impossible becomes possible in its storytelling apparatus and we get these wicked cool um, you know camera camera angles and lens and lens uses um, but in terms of a uh, how has it succeeded because of its mode of real? It, as highlight, it's there were numerous simultaneous creative bursts uh, working together with this series, and 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 that it just accelerated its appeal and its ability to draw in from an, on a number of fronts. Um, uh, there was a uh, something released leaked to the public. I think Brian Cranston was doing his wrap up show round of interviews. Okay, so making the the late night talk show circuit when the show was finally closing up, or perhaps when it was heading into that final award season burst, and um, he shared a private letter that was written to him or t to him to the cast, and it was a letter written by a renowned, sort of, you know, high society, classically trained stage actor, an Academy Award winning actor, Anthony Hopkins. And Anthony Hopkins gushes in this letter uh, that the, the quality of this series is of nothing he's ever seen before. It eclipses television itself and perhaps even um, greater parts of, of art 
and you can locate that online and see why that's more, I mean, it's intended to be a private message, a private response. He even talks about how he, he binge watched it, right? So it, all of this contemporary uh, language and everyone just loved, right? The internet exploded, as we say, with uh, sharing this, this instance. And, um, and lo and behold, well, fast forward a year or two later, now Anthony Hopkins, right? Grabbing his own TV show. He's on HBO's Prestige, super duper expensive and slick looking Westworld. Um, and, and then he's also voiced uh, a bit of like regret or sadness that, that, that the letter was even shared in the first place. But going back to something Elizabeth was priming us for earlier, I would look at something like that, that kind of marker from within the industry is even signaling and saying, okay, here is the threshold. We're, we're, we're now announcing, like we're waving a white flag and saying, you've done it, All right? You have, you have transitioned the medium. I mean, so that's a kind of interesting example there, right? Where everyone, almost everyone, almost, there's a few critics out there where was, uh, was uh, moved by the power of this text. Why does the author talk about how he is supposed to like Mad Men? Why is he saying it is good, it is a good series if he strongly dislikes it so much? Looking at around page 228, there's what's happening here. He's recognizing Mad Men's quality, okay? He's recognizing it is a quality, a quality made show, well acted, Etc. While he has some uh, subjective critiques and criticism that he wants to pull apart, okay. And I noted before he's alluded Mattel writing here in Complex TV is alluding to a different piece that he wrote for a different project earlier, you know, years back. In fact, way back before. It, or not not mid show when Mad Men was sort of in it, only a few seasons deep. He was writing a highly critical piece about the series, and um, so I mean it's entirely possible his 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 assessment of it has has evolved in some way, or it's entirely possible that he still holds it in that light. Um, but what we can recognize here is that's a great way of reading that difference. He wants to know between quality versus complexity. Okay. He's he's recognizing it has a quality about it, and it has some complexities, but he absolutely refuses to buy into its you know its 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 textual uh, its textuality. All right, very good. Final question, Phineas and Ferb. In your opinion, do you think kids are so engaged with this show, Phineas and Ferb, because they wish they could live the life? Uh, the life of Phineas and Ferb? Well, kids want to live and enact anything that points uh, uh, to reality as fun and exciting. So if, uh, if, it, if, if, it's in, if it's got a kid excited, if they're having fun, I mean, that's, that's what they, wanna, they want to um, dwell in that place, in that space. And that's what, and that's what makes TV so appealing and exciting, right? We buy in, we invest uh, in these shows, in these characters, in these narratives for a number of reasons, but a lot of it, you know, has to do with this, our own imaginations, our own creativity, uh, enjoyment, pleasure of the text, wanting to buy in and uh, get lost, if you will, and enjoy uh, that process of working through uh, complex television, and simple television alike. Okay, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Uh, I don't know, I'm gonna have to contact Guinness Guinness uh, World Records right now, shoot them an email, retweet them or something, and see if we've broken our own record on over overtime of, uh, of video discussion for week three, but, but it was fun exploring these texts even more. Hopefully you get something out of it and Oh, we're looking forward to week four discussion because we're getting into it. We're finally there. We're hitting peak, uh, peak form, pun intended. Uh, we're going to look at the serial 
melodrama as our genre of choice, and I can't wait to read and respond to your questions. Thank you.